Mishra. Uh, he's the, uh, he researches and teaches on development related issues that intertwine between social philosophy, analytical measurement and applied development. Uh, he has widely published on agrarian issues and measurement of development indicators and poverty. Uh, he was uh, uh, formerly the director at the Navakrishna Chaudhary Center for Development Studies, uh, an ICSSR institute set up in collaboration with government of Odisha. Uh, during his stay there, he was instrumental in spearheading the Odisha Millets mission that brought together the government, civil society and academia for a pro-people action research initiative that works in four verticals, production, processing, marketing and consumption. Uh, his uh, important work on farmer suicides in Maharashtra led to setting up a Vasantrao Naik Shetkari Swabilamban mission and other policy outcomes, including deliberations leading to debt waiver. Uh, he has been a guest scholar at Meiji University, Japan during June 2016, and ICCR Chair Professor of Indian Studies at National Chengchi University, Taiwan uh, in 2015 and Subit Chaudhary Fellow on Quality and Economics, uh, London School of Economics and Political Science during spring of 2014. Uh, but before venturing out to other places, he was he's from our own Center for Development Studies. He's MPhil and PhD on uh, tribal agrarian economies were carried out at uh, CDS. And uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have him here. And, uh, he will be talking on the uh, Odisha Millets mission, and uh, we look forward to hear from you, sir. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Tiago. I'd love to be uh, there in the brick and mortar uh, space, the Bakerian structures uh, that motivates all of us. So, but hopefully some other time, I'll, uh, <laughs> you will be there. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks. In a, in a way, I did uh, listen to Jaydeep's uh, talk earlier in the day, and somewhere uh, my work on the farmer suicides in Maharashtra, there was, in spite of a lot of public policy issues by government of Maharashtra, government of India, and others uh, on those lines, still there was a friendly academic critic saying that, uh, has the farmer benefited? So that led me to work uh, along with a lot of civil society organizations. Uh, in fact, uh, association of Tiagu goes back uh, in some sense uh, to, to the coming together of research with civil society, uh, with the revitalizing rain-fed agriculture network. So when I moved to Bhuvaneshwar, so there was this call from the civil society friends that we need to do something on millets. Uh, we need a consultation Workshop. I thought, yes, why we can always have a workshop in academia. Workshops are always welcome. But they said, no, no, we want the government to be a very integral part of this workshop. So that let me think. And then we wrote a two page uh, sort of a poly, uh, two page um, uh, conception note motivating that because of malnut malnourishment and because of uh, the changing uh, or the climate uh, concerns that we see increasing. Uh, long dry spells or in intense short uh, wet spells that have been observed in recent times. So these were some of the concerns, the climate and nutrition is where we pitched that two page uh, conception note. And uh, it, that started uh, uh, this exercise. So in a sense, uh, going back to the work on farmer suicides or my dated work or my tedious work on uh, agrarian societies, or tribal agrarian societies. So somewhere uh, down the line, they're thinking this picture actually conveys that thinking that rural is somewhere pulling the urban, rural is uh, subsidizing the urban. Uh, so in, in that thought, in that ethos, uh, that uh, the chain is not moving. Okay. So in that in that ethos, so this academic, uh, what is it that while to the government we did put forth something like it should be malnourishment and uh, and climate resilience, but in the back of my mind there was something how do we address uh, how do we be inclusive how do we address uh, spaces that have been left out 
uh, groups that have been worse off. So if you look at this uh, diagram or this uh, x-axis is about the better off and y-axis is, uh, is the worse off. And if we have this line of equality uh, there, if anything below this line of equality like this point Z here, basically says that at Z, uh, uh, we are below the line of equality. That means from Z, E is the shortfall from the line of equality for Y. Uh, and uh, so how do we reach the line of equality? How do we be inclusive? So there have been various ways historically uh, that thinkers have thought through or actual evidence shows that what it is like one way uh, where how rural life or peasant life has been uh, has been understood in a feudal uh, kind of a setup we say that when uh, the returns to land increasing returns to land is not to the proletariate it is given to the people uh, rather those who own the have the property right of the land or those who claim uh, ownership of any additional intervention that will be somewhere like ZA, where the worse of people continue to get their subsistence wage or subsistence ethic, uh, whereas people, those who are better off, get the additional increments in wealth. Now, people started questioning such kind of a thinking and said, no, no, uh, uh, while we may not have uh, the historical uh, differences is may be difficult to explain or different to substantiate, but at least henceforth in future, uh, what should we do? We should maintain the status quo in some sense. So then this uh, the inequality discourse started coming in in terms of the Gini index. And that Gini indicates, index basically says that my shares of at least Y and X should remain same or shares of the poor and rich should remain the same. So that is the ZB line where the Gini coefficient will remain the same. Uh, then people started thinking, no, Gini coefficient will mean that uh, if there is an increment in wealth in 100 rupees, and if the current share of is in 30s to 70 ratios for the 100 rupees wealth that is being generated, that will also be shared in 30s to 70 ratio. That means the rich get 70% and the poor get 30%, which somehow doesn't again uh, adhere to our thinking or thinking of addressing inequality or inclusiveness. So some people said, no, no, uh, let let keep the past aside again. What we should do is that hereafter we should share the returns equally. So that will be like ZC. Uh, but what we are proposing is that something should be, if actually we need to reach the line of equality, we reach, need to be inclusive, we should be somewhere between this ZED, that triangle. So what is ZD? ZD we are trying to tell is that it should be proportional to shortfall. Suppose the worse of have 30, uh, and uh, better off have 70 and let us say ideal is somewhere around 100 for both so the shortfall for the better off is 30 from 100 and for the worse off is 70 from 100 so what we would say is that any an incremental increase in wealth suppose one unit increase in wealth or whatever spaces that we are talking about if that is to be increased by one units 70 percent of that or should go to the worse off and 30 percent should go at least 70 percent should go to the worse off and 30 percent should go to the better off now, ZD is a line which says that the entire increments in additional wealth or spaces should go to the worse off. Now, how do we explain this? Like in the current pandemic, uh, when we say, suppose I look at the spaces as health and something else, education, my entire focus moves to health. So that is like giving to ZE. Similarly, if certain groups of people need to be given our entire focus, that can be explained like ZE. So, but in a Rawlsian kind of a reasonably plural world, but even within this space, I would say that we can be somewhere between Z, E, D. That there can be uh, there can be a large amount of space where we can be inclusive. But real world is actually somewhere between A and B. We still do not try to reach uh, the Gini coefficient. Also, in many scenarios, when we look at Piketty's analysis and other analysis that you will see, uh, and uh, of course we are doing much better than uh, like A, Z, A. Uh, but uh, that's uh, that is what the thing is now given this uh, uh, ideal uh, kind of a philosophical positioning that ZED is our space so what is it that we need to do given uh, Jaideep's uh, thinking of a crisis of farm crisis farmers crisis which I will come and elaborate in a bit now suppose this is about people this is about crops and this is about rain fed areas Jaideep did mention about rain fed areas Jaideep did uh, mention somewhere about millets so rain fed uh, the 
post green revolution scenario in india has been neglect neglect of largely rain fed areas or wherever we try to think about developing rain fed areas we trying to build the green revolution model to rain fed areas similarly this rain fed areas uh, this green revolution has been a focus of rice and wheat to begin with and then whenever we tried to extend it to other crops it was in this uh, what we did to rice and wheat we should do but by and large there are certain crops like millets which are nutritious which are also uh, both uh, can uh, withstand biotic and abiotic stress biotic stress is like uh, plants and weeds uh, it can uh, withstand them more compared to rice and wheat and abiotic stress is about climate that resilience that we are talking about so these crops somehow have been orphaned have been neglected and uh, uh, it so happens that the people those who still continue to grow some of these crops which uh, still largely stay in rain fed areas are largely populated by indigenous peoples so we think that indigenous peoples or the tribals the orphan crops millets and rain fed areas these are our workshop whichever this can be three different spaces but they can also superimpose on each other so we thought if we want to focus on these group of people crops and areas and then can we think of at least, at least as as an philosophical level imposing a policy where how we try to bring in inclusiveness in this while being perfectly aware that real world is somewhere between a and b Now, getting back to what Jaydeep was saying, uh, to reiterate, uh, 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 excuse me if I'm trying to reiterate somewhere, the way we try to understand crisis is of a twin dimensions, agrarian and agricultural, little semantics here, but by agrarian, we refer to the livelihood of people, whether they are farmers, land and agricultural laborers, and all those who are dependent on agriculture. And uh, by agricultural, we refer to the developmental aspect of it, the, uh, the planning and policy aspect of it, so while agrarian crisis is uh, uh, referring to the threat, uh, threat to the livelihood of all those people dependent on them, uh, but this developmental crisis or agriculture crisis or the neglect of agriculture in designing of programs and allocation of resources. The green revolution, again, to talk about it a bit, came out about a crisis in the 60s. Some people said that we are in a food to mouth, particularly in urban areas. And uh, of course, there, were, there was a drought, uh, consecutive droughts in 60s. We had two wars so there was an emergency situation to extend but emergency situation should always be responded through an emergency and it should not be responded by something which should be permanent we responded to an emergency situation by permanent and in fact this uh, 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 the lessons from here is also very important for our current pandemic pandemic is an emergency scenario and we seem to be responding to the pandemic as if to alter our permanent structures of course what things were two years ago should not be the same two years down the line, but somewhere the errors that we did for green revolution, I think that we are trying to do in our response to the pandemic also. I will of course not be focusing my talk on the pandemic uh, and the former again is about the displacement of people and the second is about displacement of ideologies like it is not distribution, but again production emphasis on production that is uh, Now, having said that, uh, what is it? Let me let me explain this crisis in terms of some abstract uh, theoretical numbers. Uh, let us say the pre-green revolution or the 60s kind of a scenario as such, uh, where we are largely dependent on monsoon Asia. Monsoon uh, uh, was our agriculture. We had some input of one units that gave us an output of three units. And so our net returns were three minus one, that was two and like our marginal propensity to consume, let us assume to be about 65%. So we consumed 1.3 of these units. The remaining 0.7 units was our savings. And uh, uh, so let us say three, three normal agricultural years we had. So our cumulative savings at the end of these three years was 2.1 units. And suppose we had a bad year, our fourth year was a bad year, was a drought or a flood or my crop loss was there. And I'm deliberately taking as an extreme example. Now if this happens, my net returns turns out to be minus one because I already invested in my inputs, but I did not get any returns. So my net returns uh, output being zero, my net returns becomes negative. What do I do? I draw from my savings. I take something out 
uh, I give one unit back to my input. So I am re remaining with 1.1, which I use for my consumptions. So we, uh, in a three to five year cycle of uh, agricultural ups and downs, somehow some kind of a subsistence uh, uh, equilibrium was the, what the peasant societies had developed. Now with a food to uh, mouth crisis in the 60s, we thought we will go for an input intensive uh, agriculture. Uh, so here we increased our inputs and our outputs also doubled. So uh, we see that our net returns are also increased by about 50%. And uh, as our income increases, assuming that our consumption marginal propensity to consume will be slightly less, which is about 60% compared to the 65% earlier. And so we, we consumed 1.8 units. We have a savings point 1.2, which is previous than the pre-green revolution scenario. And the end of three years, again, suppose I have 3.6 units, but look at it here, holy grail. If on the fourth year I have a bad monsoon or a bad crop loss here, now my net negative uh, net returns become negative, which is three times, and my consumption uh, after I take care of these negative returns can only be 0 0.6, so the remaining amount of my savings. Either I have to borrow. So this actually explains the indebtedness and the crisis that an input-intensive agriculture gives you. So, so some of you may question that okay, we may not have such an extensive scenario. Some crop may be remaining. Uh, but compared to the pre-green revolution, we have explained as an abstract sense what would be an extreme scenario in both those situations. And uh, the problem, what should be understood is that the green revolution or the input intensive intervention that we have, which includes financial as well as technological intervention, basically the input increased by more than almost three times, whereas output increased twice. So it's like if you look at uh, sense, the choice of technique, the choice of techniques as a technology is good. If my, for the same input cost, kind of for a same input investments or input things, I get more output. Or for the less of input, I get the same output. Now, here what we are doing is that my out input is increasing, my output is also increasing, but the rate of increase in my input is much higher than the rate of increase in output. And that is where the crisis is. So even if you get a debt waiver, even if you give various other kinds of interventions, if you continue with this kind of agriculture, this crisis is going to hit, hit you back again and again. This is a stylized way of representing. Now, uh, uh, earlier session in the day was also talking about sustainable solutions. Now, suppose we say that, okay, let us try to talk about an alternative, which is not taking us back to pre-green revolution, but we combine some of our traditional understanding, some knowledge where our input does increase and uh, output has also increased. Some people may say output will be low. Some will say output will not fall, like some experiments in Andhra that is happening here. So, but let us say that, okay, initial years output somewhat falls. Again, I'm trying to take an extreme. Suppose it is my net returns. I'm trying to make it similar to the uh, uh, green revolution scenario. So here, if you see if my net returns is same, I put the marginal propensity to consume again at 60%. So end of third years, you see that I am better off than the input intensive scenario, at least if I try to understand it from a farmer's perspective. Now, what is, so this inclusiveness that we are talking about, so we think that that inclusiveness should be also talking about a sustainable uh, solution, should be talking about reducing input costs to the farmer, and uh, at the same time, our net returns uh, could be uh, same or better. And uh, so having said that, now, what is what is the situation in agriculture and particularly in the millet growing farmer scenario that we try to understand before we intervene? And uh, one thing what we what we observed is that suppose uh, the dotted lines are our supply uh, lines and our demand lines, as we understand. But uh, in in the, the uh, what happens actually is that in uh, if the farmer is one the one who is producer and the demand that the farmer thinks is lower than the actual demand. Because in the rain fed area, the tribal farmer who is actually producing in conditions, his information set or her information set is such that they think that they get a lower price and uh, because of whatever asymmetry of information and whatever you want to bring in. And when they get that lower price, they are of the opinion that the demand for my crop is much less. On the other hand, the consumer, like now urban consumers or many even rural areas, the consumer thinks that millets are nutritious, they are healthy, uh, unlike unlike the uh, earlier given good kind of a scenario, which still exists in some pockets in India, but that is more or less changing. And the consumer is thinking that this is a healthy good, 
the smart board uh, but uh, they think that uh, uh, the supply is actually lower the consumer uh, uh, the consumer think that uh, supply is uh, um, higher than what the actual supply is and uh, uh, the consumer ends up paying a higher price while the uh, producer uh, uh, gets a lower price now with this mismatch it's like the chicken and egg problem now the farmer thinks that there is not much of a demand for my produce and the consumer thinks that okay there is not much of a supply when a lay consumer like you and me cannot afford to eat this healthy nutritious food though we adapt, though we accept that these are certain healthy uh, uh, health benefits to this or nutritional benefits to this now given this uh, uh, supply uh, demand mismatch given this uh, uh, what should how we should go about addressing this we thought that we need to address this together and to address this together we thought that the intervention should be in four verticals how to increase production through improved agronomic practices like taking knowledge of both tradition as well as science together system of crop intensification seed treatments divider and other things processing uh, and marketing is also very important but the, uh, i'll come to this later consumption also we brought about a lot of consumer awareness programs uh, through angan uh, there, there were uh, there have been efforts to bring back millets into anganwadi through icds mid day meal schools and uh, there are various awareness programs about what should be a recipes how recipes can be healthy they still retain nutrition they can again be both traditional and uh, modern some people those nostalgic about millets somewhere had the picture that millets are not very healthy it is a very bland food but uh, in this consumer awareness things how millets can also bring in modern we can have cakes we can have pastries we can have also savouries like our mixture or paisams and various other things can be also cooked through millets in fact everything that can be cooked with our rice and wheat can also through some modification be cooked through millets so now uh, this gap also needs to be addressed through marketing so how do we address that can we develop value chains so shg groups uh, we try to facilitate through the women shg groups whether this can happen another very crucial link about this processing now this while on the one hand i did mention that let's have a biotic and abiotic advantage or uh, withstanding to withstand stress but once millet is processed once you convert it into a flour then the shelf life of millets actually reduces compared to say rice or even wheat so that means the uh, shelf life or the window that uh, from the processing to consumption reduces a lot so these needs to be addressed through appropriate value additions appropriate Uh, supply chain logistics so this the whole uh, 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 exercise would mean that we are actually entering into multiple domains together we are trying to break silos in multiple ways which i will try to elaborate in a moment so to break this multi to bring this intervention in multiple domains a very unique institutional architecture was proposed in that consultation meeting that i suggest i told no in december we we came up with a consultation exercise where uh, when my friends in the civil society said that let us have this meeting i was skeptical but i suggested that let us go ahead with a two page uh, 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 note consultation note and once i shared this consultation note, note with someone senior in the government somehow i think our thinking and his the person's thinking clicked and yes i think we can go ahead with this consultation and uh, being a senior official this person uh, uh, wrote out a note letter actually uh, not only they owned up from day zero so the letter went out from the development commissioner's office saying that we will have this so as a result many government officials from different line departments did come into the meeting similarly civil society from across the country and also odisha participated and academia involved in some sense in different parts in karnataka the karnataka also has a cscp like the central government and the cscp uh, dr prakash he and some other academicians did try to so we had a consultation meeting so from day zero i would say so the academia government and civil society started working together and working of working together from day zero for a pro people initiative also try to understand what is each individual's constraint like many times we academicians are trained in a different way we collect data we write papers and then we criticize we critically look at the government sometimes the government may take that criticism for a policy but here we try to understand what are the constraints that the government also works with what are the constraints civil society work with and also try to convey that we also work in a constraint we we would like to publish but uh, but then that was a major uh, 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 compromise that we did 
if you would have gone on with our publish and perish kind of a thinking, we would not have contributed much to a real time policy engagement. Because sometimes uh, I'll give you one or two examples where this came in. When uh, after our initial consultation, the development commissioner suggested that we write a proposal. And in my understanding, this, this an ICSR Institute, a sister institute of yours, submitted a proposal. And then lo and behold, that proposal goes into the budget immediately. So this was quite fast in terms of policy acceptance. But once it went into the budget, there were a lot of challenges that happened over the year, over the last four or five years, whenever I was involved, associated with a lot of challenges. So this one was that that needed a convergence within and between. I will be brief and explaining what that means. So in the first, uh, after the consultation meeting and the budget thing and so-called acceptance, which took almost a year to uh, iron out small, small differences. Uh, in the first meeting uh, inception workshop that we had with nine department officials, after the meeting, one official comes up and said, all that you are saying is good, millets, this, there is this, but this is not going to go, not going to uh, take off. Why is it not going to take off and why you did not tell when your senior bureaucrats were there? So they have all worked in the ground at the district level. I cannot tell that I know more than them. So, so what is it? Now? We had one, the selection in each block, there is this uh, notion that we should select a facilitating agency, an NGO who is who has some local understanding, and there is a selection procedure, the collector would be involved. But the appointment of that facilitating agency, we left to the PD Atma, the board, PD, uh, uh, the Atma board. So you know, the, uh, then this official said the Atma board is supposed to meet every quarter, but they generally may not meet every quarter. And whenever they meet, they'll have a lot of things in their agenda. So if you're bringing something new, if you're lucky, maybe one or two places may approve what you are suggesting, but in many places they may defer it. So you you will be throwing your baby with the back bath water. So then why didn't you tell this? He said, no, I cannot tell this there because they are my seniors. But then we as an academicians, we could take it back. Uh, when we went back to Bhuvaneshwar, immediately had a word with the development commissioner, the secretary agriculture and other things. They immediately agreed, yes, 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 no, no, this is a very relevant point. We will make necessary changes in the guidelines. So that's how, so this is just a small example, but that way there are a lot of things where we try to understand what the problem is, try to give a solution, real-time solution. Maybe sometimes in most of, more often than not, there was no documentation about this. I, I'll come about it in a moment. So when we did not have about this uh, documentation ready and when officials change, then they start thinking, what is this academia group doing here? Because on the one hand, we somehow kept aside our own agenda of publish in Paris because otherwise, how do we give real time advice? On the other hand, we did not have any documentary evidences. So that led to coming up with policy briefs, which of course was not exactly the real time advice that you are giving, but something somewhere in between when we tried to give something more or at least Somewhere where it was feasible, we gave three page notes, we converted that into a policy brief. So I think, so this convergence, uh, again, what is this convergence within and between? So one is, of course, between is now understood that uh, academia, government and civil society, we try to work together. So we call this a KPP interaction. So what is within? Again, outside, it will look, knowledge is, uh, we know that academia is not again the same. Uh, uh, if you look at the four verticals of intervention, you'll see that we need agro agronomic sciences, Within agronomy, we need soil, hydrology, seed, and so on and so forth. We need marketing science, uh, understanding of marketing. We need an uh, understanding of the processing science behind and how that processing and other science and technology can reduce shelf life. Uh, we also need our understanding of consumer behavior, consumer awareness. So, so socioeconomic aspects, science and technology aspects, agro agricultural science aspects, marketing aspects. So the, the knowledge is much more uh, we need to break the silos within or between different knowledge or within the knowledge and academia. In government, again, from outside to begin with, we thought that government is one whole. But when you start working in the government, you know, agriculture department has to actually address concerns raised by the law department or the finance department on the budget constraints and or the policy designing by the planning uh, and convergence department and so on and so forth. And plus, when you start expanding the program, we need women and women self-help groups to be partners in various spaces. We need ICDS, uh, again, that is part of uh, women and child development to be part of it. We need procurement of these grains to take in then uh, perhaps food and uh, corporate uh, marketing, food and co uh, cooperation department also need to come in. So this convergence between government between departments of government, between line departments they can become important. And also within a department, when you, again, within agriculture, the finance 
department or the they also within the agriculture department they could have finance they could have law they could have various sections which will try to address concerns so we also need to address within department concerns so the convergence uh, when we say within and between it is also within academia within government and within civil society again from outside civil societies may look as one but when you start working different civil society groups may have different understanding some people have come in because of uh, their concern for the tribals some others have come in because of millets some others have come in because they want sustainable agriculture yet others are there for rights human rights so all these different different entities may sometimes become your partners in one block a is a partner in another block b is a partner and even if the a is partner if the person handling that so, uh, that changes then their their outlook will also change so what i'm saying is this convergence and uh, this was also a real experience in how do we address multiple uh, uh, concerns of convergence so uh, having said that the point that i would like to take you is that this was the uh, this was the kind of a baseline scenario if i would like to bring to your notice the top uh, left side uh, uh, figure that you are seeing is about india's area and production while area fell down drastically from the uh, green revolution time as you will see production has been fluctuating and somehow not fallen as much as uh, as uh, area has fallen but in odisha's case which is the second figure you will see that first area fell and then production also fell almost secular there has been a secular decline but here in odisha the decline has been since 80s unlike uh, india's case where area decline has been since 60s so and uh, while the decline in production in orissa to begin with uh, was because of area but subsequently also because of production or yield effects it was there now uh, just what i wanted to tell you about orissa if you look at the last one or two years just immediately after this program has come in this program was initially i'll talk about the program expansion in a, in a while you'll see that there is a, maybe a slight uh, uh, revival perhaps is happening so and uh, another important concern that i would like to bring you there was this field work again sort of a baseline or our initial interventions that we did about 50 odd households in kandamal and uh, from a methodological point of view what we tried to do we wanted to understand nutritional deprivation where this focus group the uh, so the, uh, the poverty measure all of you might be familiar with the foster grade for the poverty measure where the r should be understood as z and uh, your c is your income like y i but here we have made a substantive difference this r i j has become a variable now that means our poverty line is not constant so why we have made a poverty line as a variable or uh, here we say refer refer to as a nutrient requirement and first of all there can be multiple calorie protein fat calcium iron and you can add other nutrients micronutrients if you want each is a different and each requirement for each could be different for and this requirement could be household specific so we took this age gender their occupation and also their lactating and pregnant status to identify from the nin what could be their requirement and based on this uh, conversion uh, that gopal and etals uh, nin book we if they uh, the food that they consumed in last 24 hours was converted again to a consumption what they consumed in terms of this specific nutrients so if there is a shortfall from this requirement minus consumption we converted that into a shortfall so the uh, fgt fosters method has been uh, slightly if we made an improvement by making the poverty line as a variable and then we identified that this is the kind of deprivation that is there and this is actually quite striking once one looks at deprivation calcium deprivation is almost 100% fat deprivation is substantial iron is also quite high now i will stop with this i will take a bit on this calcium and iron now millets actually have particularly ragi or finger millet that we refer to has good calcium component good iron component and uh, yet uh, we have uh, uh, societies which are traditionally growing this things there is so much of deprivation or shortfall nutritional shortfalls in iron and calcium now why this is happening uh, of course over the years uh, the production has gone down consumption in terms of rice and wheat through the pds has increased uh, some healthy food like say uh, gooseberry which is available regularly and some other locally items which is available and there is a lot of Uh, uh, what do you call drain? Uh, this is the term I did use for my PhD uh, work, MPhilan PhD work back in CDS. The grain drain that one observed there. One thing that it's not just grain, resource drain or uh, various kinds of food items produced here has been drained out. Local people don't consume them. They are not aware that these are health, or at least there is not effort to uh, make them aware to make it uh, 
uh, make this available this consumptions there have been some efforts of course i won't say that the government has been silent or civil society has been silent but it hasn't been helpful at least from our uh, survey or our uh, data that we see now having having this kind of a background then in 2017 in the first year of intervention uh, uh, it was in the middle of june when if those of you are familiar with monsoon asia or agricultural india peasant societies mid june by mid june uh, agricultural activities is almost the planning of agriculture activities both in the individual sphere as well as the public sphere by the government is completed completed much before june 15th in fact if some of you have been following the news in odisha like early may was uh, they call this akshat rutia uh, which uh, which is a very important present uh, uh, or the initiation into agriculture festival in odisha because this is the day that farmers go and do just at least begin the plow there are uh, the historical or the uh, functional part of this is that uh, there might have been pre monsoons so the initial plowing starts now uh, the main plowing happens uh, to loosen up the soil and the main plowing of course happens after monsoon sets in but this is where the agriculture season activity for the next season begins in so june 15th is quite late and then when in 17 18 we had this uh, final go ahead to in uh, mid of june we were also skeptical but then uh, we did this uh, survey uh, we did this baseline survey uh, in 17 18 itself of the 16 17 data and we also had a follow up understanding of the 17 18 data so if you look at this, uh, there are some different discrepancies between the government data, uh, government final numbers and our numbers. That is because the government uh, numbers is identified with the incentives that they gave. And that incentive was identified with, of course, checks and balances. So as a result, many people, those who did join the program, they did not get the incentive. That's why the number of farmers that the government will say, or the hectares that the government will say, the number of farmers, they broadly agree with it. But the area they don't agree with it. They say that uh, it is about three thousand odd hectares, not five thousand. So even uh, uh, so, they may say that the area increase perhaps has not happened as we are trying to claim. Uh, 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 but having said that, uh, uh, even then there will be some area increase with even if you go by the government data. Now the production uh, uh, with our data, with our estimates and our uh, baseline, and uh, this is household uh, data that we have. So our uh, production data basically shows that production, if you look at the figure to the right hand side, your area increase is 44% and uh, uh, quantity quintals per hectare as well as the value per hectare has increased 120%. That means more than double and the value per household, which also is a combination of these two has more than tripled by 216%. So even if one says that uh, if I go by the government data on terms of uh, acreage increase and I said that no, it's not 44%, but maybe 10%. So the value per household may not have increased by three times, but definitely by more than two times, uh, somewhere more than two times to three times, that will be the figure. So now this is actually was a very turning point in our understanding. And uh, what, uh, and, and this turning point is actually will be explained to you. When we gave the proposal to the government, we thought that we will showcase about this four verticals, production, processing, marketing, and consumption uh, things in this 30 blocks spread across 70 districts. But once this uh, intervention happened and there was this success, which farmers, the government from their own feedback, uh, independent of our own feedback, the government also took their feedback. So now people started demanding from their side, why is it that you have left? I will just give an example. When we started this program, some well-meaning officials told that CC, it's not that easy. Even I have, we have tried. And one official also told that uh, who is a very senior now. In fact, he's in academia world also. Uh, uh, was bureaucracy in academia, having uh, been secretary to government of India. So he and many others uh, in that similar position they give this example. So when they tried in uh, 80s or even 90s to try to bring back millets, so there was this example. I'll, I'll speak in the Desia area. So tor poor kai khai wo bato roti, more poor kai khai wo mandia. It's like, why would your son or your daughter uh, eat rice and uh, wheat? Uh, why you should mine eat mandia or uh, finger millet or ragi? So that was the kind of that the same kind of uh, perception building as if it's a coarse grain. These are different goods that poor men food and we should not be eating. But contrast to that, when this success happened, we started getting calls, which again, if I if I sort of paraphrase them or try to again speak in their language, is that amukai maach hai kar dela. So why have you made us orphans? Why, why have you made us as if we are motherless children? 
so you can see this this change in perception even in a tribal uh, hinterland uh, orissa has slowly started changing in the first year of our intervention so the demand started coming why is my village not included why is my block not included so local mlas local politicians they started calling so in the first year itself in, we we were thinking how we will address this 30 and then we got this 55 and before we could think through what to do with this 55 it has gone to 72 blocks and then 76 blocks in the fourth year and by the fifth year by the time i was i had already moved out when I, but, but the talks were already on so we had gone into 84 blocks and not only we had more gone into 84 blocks we started it started with a state plan then district mineral fund because many of these uh, areas are tribal districts at least two districts now the three three districts have been funding in through, through district mineral fund uh, program like the sundargarh one the uh, kyaunchar and now angul also so now at the end of 2021 22 when we are beginning 22 23 on the 3rd of may akshay trutiya as i was referring to government of odisha has announced that they will be expanding this to 142 blocks in the next next 5 years uh, across spread across 19 districts so you see this uh, growth about 8000 farmers and here i am referring to the government figure the previous numbers for 17 18 was our estimates but here is the government figure so the farmers you will see numbers are more or less similar with ours 8000 but the area is slightly lower than ours and but whether we refer to our figures of 5,000 hectares or their figure of 3,000 hectares, see in five years, 21, 22, it has gone to more than 50,000 hectares and more than a lakh farmers, one lakh 18,000 farmers as of uh, uh, last count. And procurement started in the second year from 17, 18,000, nearly 18,000 quintals to nearly 3 lakh uh, uh, 20,000 plus quintals. So number of farmers selling in procurement has gone on from 6,000 to 40,000. So this has been the thing. And I will give a contrasting picture again. All of you might have seen the images of the farm. There is a, there is a talk I see of the farm crisis and the farmers gathered uh, in and around Delhi. And uh, um, so there people came in tractors and vehicles and, and you see the kind of a farmer that we are referring to. In Malkangiri in December, 2019, in 17 or 18, that area which is called the cutoff area, the Simanchal area, got connected because of a bridge that was built. Otherwise, it is uh, marooned from three sides with water and one side by forest. So, so this area, uh, which is otherwise known as left, left wing extremism area, and people hardly go there. So the first ever procurement center for any grain was set up in December 2019. And here, I, uh, I should have actually got a picture. So here, if you contrast the Delhi uh, agitation to this, here people, there people came in tractors, in vehicles, here people came in headloads, in, in, in mules, in boats to come and sell. And people also sold in cages here. And because we were opening it for the first time, we did allow people to, or the government allowed, or the people present there allowed them to sell even in cages too. Someone came with two cages or three cages. So this is the kind of uh, 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 a, a procurement also production in the four verticals that we are talking about. So this is one intervention. Uh, uh, sweets are being now served in many Anganwadis. And this also has got a linkage, as I said, no? Uh, Anganwadis, ICDS, of course, work through Women and Child Welfare Department. But this women SAG groups have now become taken up a very prominent role. In fact, in 50 places last year, uh, the, uh, the procurement of these grains, the first collection center were through FPOs, which are manned by women SAGs. Uh, uh, the uh, millet sweets, the ragi laddus are, are being pre prepared by women SAGs. Various cafe, uh, cafes and uh, stalls have been opened up where millet, savouries, millet products have been sold across the state, which are again being manned by women SAG groups. So this is, uh, there are a lot of participatory varietal trials that have happened. In fact, uh, where uh, we not only give emphasis on productivity, but what is that the farmer wants? What is that the lady wants who, who can be a farmer, but also cooks? And they many times we see these farmers or lady farmers when they come, including men farmers, when they come for this participatory varietal tire, they will pick up the grain from the panicle and they'll, they'll taste it, they'll smell it. So our traditional understanding of a varietal trial was that you just focus on yield or something like that. Here, there are various other traits that are looked into your taste, your things, that strength, whether the stem is strong enough, whether cattle will also eat my uh, uh, new varieties, this GM thing that was being talked about again in Vidarbha, if I recall uh, back to Vidarbha days. So uh, I think, was it Mr. Prakash Pohre or uh, or someone uh, who referred to me that uh, the farmers there, uh, the not forget about the farmers, when this GM cotton seeds were brought in, 
the cattle refused to eat uh, the hey i think uh, tiago may be having better knowledge and uh, sarthak is also there they may be able to tell you more about this thing so uh, uh, as i as i told you uh, another problem about millets is that millets are small grains and uh, their processing is different uh, uh, rice mills will not be able to process we need different things so what happens is processing of uh, particularly uh, this minor millet small millet like little millet uh, foxtail millet barnyard millet brown top millet which are actually the healthier ones compared to bajra jowar and ragi so these healthier millets as dr kadarwali would say are the positive millets the, their processing is much more tedious it could be uh, back breaking so uh, with a greater focus on women household labor so uh, uh, recently uh, there is a small nano enterprise uh, small dehuller kind of an intervention that has a mixy like kind of thing has happened we are trying to experiment that in various places which will reduce your workload and will it increase consumption will it reduce drudgery that's what one uh, experimentation that we are trying so as part of this uh, larger exercise and intervention so lot of uh, there are there are thousand challenges i would say but i think the the way that one went ahead is that to take the challenge as they come and to complement and supplement uh, through this uh, a uh, tripartite of course academia has uh, taken a, a withdrawn by allowing government and civil society to work together work together initially our was work was more as a catalyst and then we uh, withdrew and we were in the back and trying thing and if there was any issue or a problem then coming in now of course i have moved out others might have been taking that role so so now uh, this uh, this odisha millets mission uh, Uh, a couple of things i would like to say first is that when we talk about millets we are talking about millets in a in a holistic kind of a space millets uh, production are not being talked about in the same uh, monocropping kind of a scenario as if growing millets means that i should stop growing uh, rice or wheat or i should stop growing other things millets can be grown in intercropping spaces in crop rotations and in various other ways and uh, uh, the uh, the symbiotic logic of livestock land and uh, and uh, will hold here so this let me elaborate on jaydeep was referring to livestock and all should be part of agriculture and ally so what i i would say is that like this old mcdonald song you might, might have heard uh, maybe uh, that was this is a tipping the other kind of tipping that happens in cds uh, after uh, evening parties so uh, one of the songs is old mcdonald had a farm and uh, but what i would like to take you is that in that old mcdonald farm we talk about hens we talk about ducks we talk about Uh, livestock of various kinds we talk about farm lands so what i say this is a symbol a farmer then even in that old uh, british nursery rhyme is about or, a, or an english nursery rhyme is about the symbiotic relationship so the livestock provides food uh, as well as manure for your plants food for the human beings uh, people provide effort for both plants and uh, uh, and uh, livestock and plants provide fodder for animals and again food for human beings so you see the symbiotic relationship if it happens within a farm there is no buying and selling that is happening but there is a symbiotic relationship which reduces uh, your input intensiveness it reduces that cost and that symbiotic relationship is what our millet intervention is uh, ought to be whether it actually again happens like uh, i begin with that inclusive space now we have certain idealized kind of understanding what should be sustainable what should be inclusive whether we have a lot of challenges why those challenges are there because ours is not the only intervention or only force there are many other forces so having said that this so called intervention in odisha has caught attention globally as well as nationally and in some form of the other like i said i began with a kpp interaction knowledge civil society and academia while uh, the odisha intervention has gone to many places jharkhand chatisgarh telangana and there are there is a give and take Uh, we also brought something from telangana andhra and other parts uh, including uh, because when we started but there is a given take in fact today there is a news item in rajasthan local dailies that how rajasthan is trying to develop bajra through the odisha uh, millets mission in uh, model so but what they are taking all these states that they are taking from the odisha millets mission is that they are keeping aside knowledge a lot of intervention that is happening is government and civil society is coming or government is coming without civil society so that kpp interaction requires a lot of engagement and people those who need to uh, also uh, understand that uh, uh, perhaps uh, that is not happening what i would say the other thing uh, 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 that has happened from odisha as well as other developments across the country is that uh, this thinking this led to discussions uh, at a larger level in at the niti aayog 
National Rain Rainfed Area Authority, National Rural Livelihood Mission, and Government of India actually, along with many 70 other countries, put up a proposal to UN, and uh, that led to uh, 2023 being declared as the International Year of Millets. So I think a uh, lot of talk is going on there. A uh, lot of challenges are there. Uh, now uh, millets has taken a global space and global demand. And which could mean that uh, is our uh, millet farmer like the quinoa farmer of Latin America uh, will produce, will sell, but will not be able to consume. Would the nutritional concerns, uh, concerns of these people be left out because of this global uh, uh, demand and supply chain logistics coming in? Uh, whether this uh, uh, this will uh, address uh, other concerns uh, uh, of uh, climate if we try to focus on say monocropping, uh, millet cultivation, uh, because now the government also is also talking about like one district, one crop. So we'll have ragi in one district, we'll have little millet in another district, rice in another district. So these kind of uh, thinking again actually contradicts the sustainable way that uh, one thought through and one brought about. So in our sustainable thinking, millets should actually logically spread should be to the integrated farming, to more holistic way of doing agriculture, to bringing in local supply chain logistics, I began with this concern for pandemic. Let me end with this concern for pandemic. One lesson that the pandemic actually gives, at least in my understanding, is that we should strengthen local supply chain logistics, not the global chain. But actually what is happening is we are ignoring the local supply chain logistics and strengthening the global ones. And uh, those, those are concerns which will also affect our millets or agriculture, millets in particular and agriculture in general. Uh, having said that, I will stop there and I, I Wish you all. Uh, this is uh, this is Mandya Mosi, Mandya Appa, Mandya uh, Akka, Amma, whatever you want to call. Mandya is finger millet. So you see the panicles coming out from the fingers, from the head. That's how the finger millet looks like. So uh, with this, I, I'll stop. Uh, I hope I have not taken uh, more time than I ought to have. So for your questions and comments, I will stop sharing. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think that was a fascinating lecture of a uh, fascinating journey, I would say, of uh, um, how Millet's uh, mission and uh, how you dealt with all the practical issues. And I think while you deal with it, also this constant academic issue of which journal you are publishing, A star, B, B star, and all that. So that's, uh, <laughs> that is uh, interesting to hear, sir. And uh, importantly, you also uh, talked about uh, uh, the interlinkages between production, consumption, and well, well being of the household. These are sometimes uh, people focus only on one of these and uh, think that is the, that should be my focus of uh, research yes, and so on. Right. That so was also about important, sir. Um, yes, so, I'm sorry. It's pressure, right? uh, yeah, so uh, I think we could take a few questions and comments. Uh, uh, if people want to put their questions in the chat window, that is fine. Or you raise your hands, I will call you and then you could ask the questions. Yeah, so Purna, yeah. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. This is Purna Chandra Tandi. Uh, sir, I am from uh, Koraput, sir, actually. Uh, Hometown is Jaipur. So I could say that the success of the Millet Mission, it's a, like grand success. Uh, still, uh, it, uh, recently I visited my town. Uh, I can see that still there is some. I cannot hear you now. You're, you're Sandra, muted. Uh, in the edition, you're muted. Purna is muted. No, See, we could hear that you said uh, the, the challenges you're trying to tell that we could not hear. Okay. Yes, sir. Like recently I have visited uh, my place and uh, I could see that. Uh, so this, uh, you have told there is like, uh, uh, there is some uh, gap between the uh, academicians and these uh, uh, extension officers, so those who are working in district level or block level or village level. Whatever these academicians uh, bring them like some intervention or something, they take it as, as usual approach. Like they tell that, okay, it's uh, we are going, like we are doing like this, uh, nothing is like happening. 
So how to do that uh, well trade off between these uh, uh, like extension uh, setup and uh, this academician. So it's a great challenge. Otherwise, like our intervention will be uh, like uh, they are the people who can convince the farmers. Like otherwise, like we you go directly to the farmers, they will not accept us. Uh, like, so how to do this trade off uh, in, uh, like between them? And another thing is like uh, uh, I could see uh, this millet is a great opportunity for the tribal farmers for the like those who are doing surplus production. But uh, uh, somewhere else, like this middleman, uh, that uh, like uh, you, you can see that uh, the geographical location of Parapur is like so, like hilly areas, uh, there is no roadways, no kind of things. Uh, so, always this is the, another issue, like uh, to sell, I mean, uh, the mandis, uh, like they, they are not getting proper mandis in the nearest place. So, they sell it to the middleman, which is the price. So, those kind of things, it will be if it will uh, remove them. Uh, again, this uh, millet mission will be like. Uh, it is already success, but again, it will be. go ahead. Yes, so should I should I respond to this, or do I will take a couple of more? Yeah, sir, you could respond. Okay, yeah, thank you, Purna. Yeah, no, there are a thousand challenges, as I told. In fact, uh, uh, it would be a daily challenge. So, I can just narrate to begin with. Again, like in the first meeting that I was referring to, there was a person who came representing one line department. And his understanding of uh, millets, or uh, because they they had this department of core cereals, so which was covering millets as well as maize. And he said, no, no, we have a program. And he was referring to the maize program. And you know the maize program. Maize program was largely meant for uh, uh, your uh, poultry feed. Okay. Now, in fact, because uh, I was telling you know we increased from 30 to 55 to 80 to 142 now. Now, in fact, there was a particular district. Your neighboring district or part of your erstwhile Kurapur district, where we did not, we could not start millets intervention. Now we are there in that district, Navarangpur, but we could yes. not start because Navarangpur was a focus for maize, for poultry feed. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now uh, this gentleman, uh, the why I was telling to this gentleman who said that no, we have a core cereal program. He is referring to maize. So he did not know that there are crops like millets, like uh, mandia, soa, kangu, jana. Or this little millet, all these various varieties of millets, he did not even know the difference between them. He thought there was a single crop, and he thought that maize is the main crop there. Now, within uh, once the program started and the success started coming in, he was one of the champions within the department that millet should be the thing. So there have been many. So this needs constant engagement. See, at the uh, okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this challenge. The challenge to begin with was not only to convince people at the higher level, like. CMO's office on what senior bureaucrats, but also to convince people even after like why is it that once it was in the budget, why it took us one year? Because we had to now convince many people in Bhubaneswar who have to look into the nitty gritties and agree. Now this is an out of the box thinking. Here we are talking about incentives about farmers because of some practice rather than giving a uh, giving a tractor or a technology because our incentive structures are designed desired in such a way that if you Buy this equipment, then we will give 40% of it. Or if you do, so the, the structures we, see, we were thinking out of the box. So because of those questions, it was it was very difficult, uh, difficult to push through. So one was at the official level, then even at the village level. If your village extension worker at the village level is not convinced, then whatever you do, even the, all the officials say the district or block level have told him that you should do, he will not do it or she will not do it. So the thing is that our uh, approach, I'm not saying that we have been successful all this, approach was to convince them, engage them, and make them own it. And I think in that sense of ownership, the fact that the government has taken it and they are owning it, I think that is a big success of it, that they are owning it. And this ownership, you can see even at the lower level. Sometimes the thing is that we, our existing structure, see this, this democratic way of doing things that you actually, uh, 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 Bring in tradition and science, giving top-down decision knowledge and bottom-up feedback channels, which we try to bring in. I did not elaborate that. So there is a bottom-up feedback channels from the farmer onwards we try to develop, and a top-down decision making. Decision making has to be top-down. Okay, so you cannot say farmer decides and the chief minister signs on it. The chief minister will sign it based on, or the officials will sign based on their thinking that something is right that they are doing. So feedback loops and this coming up together is very important. Now the thing is that. How now here actually the academia, our or at least some of us in the academia who those who worked in the field and worked with the policymakers, so our presence 
we could engage with the policy makers at the state level and we could also go and sit down with the farmer and have a one to one chat with him and at the same time talk to the extension worker and say that this is yours and then we take a step back give them the space i think there our civil society groups also uh, did a wonderful job uh, always uh, they they were I mean, that is that is our standard again operating procedure sop if you want to say that always put them at a pedestal and it is their program and uh, we, we do have challenges, many umpteen challenges. Maybe this is not a forum to talk about those challenges, but uh, we try to address them as much as uh, possible. And we are talking about middlemen. And uh, Mani, if you are in CDS, you can go back. My uncle and PhD are from undivided Gorakhpur. So, so my understanding of middlemen goes back to them. And uh, yes, so these are important, uh, important challenges. Uh, they can increase your implicit as well as explicit costs, interest rates that the farmer could pay. Uh, because there could be a future uh, trading happening. You buy your paddy, your grain, when you still it is six months away to harvest. So these concerns and challenges are are there. Uh, but I think this procurement that space that the government brought into Ragi that gave them a space that okay, uh, uh, if if you have gone to Koraput recently and Jaipur, you would have seen that two years ago the open market prices were ten to fifteen rupees, or even in urban Koraput and Jaipur it was twenty five rupees. Today it is not that. For yes, sir. Now the thing is the challenges which I have been telling we have been telling for the last three years we have so far though they have accepted in principle sometimes policy doesn't take time we don't want what rice and wheat did to millets that ragi does to other millets okay so the, this procurement should happen with small millets there is an unmet demand for small millets our data our evidence is showing so uh, because of this unmet demand there is a market price which is still higher for small millets but there are other challenges there and I think uh, the government of India, government of Odisha, other state government, those who want to do, you know, uh, need to focus there. And once you give an open space in the market, whether middleman exists or doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. If I have options, multiple options, they will also come down, reduce their prices. So, uh, because at the end of the day, they want to make two paise profit. If someone comes in and takes away that, they will reduce their prices. So, we cannot government cannot come in and uh, do a marketing role but government can definitely provide a space where gives a competitive space where we try to like i was trying to tell you we try to can we facilitate local individuals becoming entrepreneurs they could be in the form of ssgs they can be young people uh, trying to buy and sell different in the different uh, what you call supply chain logistics that is what i was trying to tell local supply chain logistics would be sent then but we have a global pressure coming in that their supply chains are happening now that is beyond our capacity and control. That is why I was saying, while we are trying to be in that triangle where we want to be inclusive, but there are global other forces beyond our control which pushes us to be near AB only. If you look at the inclusive circle. So yes, I, I, I think there are two, three other hands and let me take those questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Himanshu, yeah. You could tell your question. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so, uh, sir, in the initial uh, couple of slides, you have shown that there are various uh, alternatives, like, for example, the pre-green revolution, input-intensive green revolution, and knowledge-based intensive sustainable solution. So, out of all these alternatives, what I could find that if you compare the cost, uh, cost like the input cost and the net return, then the knowledge-intensive sustainable solution was the better option. So, my question is, uh, have this millet mission which have taken place in Odisha has uh, applied this knowledge intensive sustainable solution entirely or it was a mix of uh, the chemical as well as some other sustainable uh, solutions like uh, the models of agriculture. There is another hand raised, should I take this question? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe one more question we'll take, sir. Huh? Uh, yeah, we know, yeah. Binod? No. Ah. Am I audible? Yeah, Binod, yeah. You can ask. Thank you, sir, for your nice presentation. A very interesting topic. And that is based on a very backward region of Odisha. And you have, in the earlier slide, what you have shown some alter, three alternatives. Okay. And in that three alternatives, in the long run, agriculture leads to subsidy and subsistence level of agriculture. But if you see a particular region which is very prone to such a particular calamities like drought prone area, 
or short prone area or any calamities which are affecting which are visiting to that particular place regularly in a regular interval then in that cases even if there is a alter, three there, there is so many alternatives but ultimately in the long run that will lead to distress and this saving and which makes the farmers or which brings the farmers to the debt trap okay this is one of my understandings and another thing is another question is in india the millet is treated as a different good and inferior good among the rural mainly rural people and in a country like india where a majority of populations living in the rural area and around more than for around 40 percent people are still illiterate then they are not bothering about the nutritional level of their food nutrition what is the nutritional level of their produce then it is very difficult to bring the millet in the consumption baskets of the of the in that in large section large section of indian population for living in in rural area so i feel that there is a need for behavioral inter interventions to bring the millet in the consumption baskets of the rural people like like government or some, some academia people they should make some type of nudging to bring that that millet into the consumption basket of the large masses thanks i think both questions are somewhat similar Maybe what I'll do is that I'll see. I when I was trying to show when I was trying to show this slide, the purpose was uh, not to say that these are three alternatives. I'm I was showing about the path, like pre-given revolution happened. Sometimes before 60s, in 60s, 70s, we had green revolution, which led to input intensive, which is still being practiced. And this knowledge intensive was the alternative that we were being seeing that when there is this crisis, that the input, uh, the debt crisis or other crisis that we are talking about, this could be a solution. Now, knowledge intensive solution, when we are saying knowledge intensive, we are not saying that knowledge intensive itself is like uh, like one one kind of a solution. In fact. Many people try to say that there is no alternative and then they go for input intensive. So I would rather say that there are multiple alternative exists and they depend upon the local resilience and the local uh, uh, situation or the local context. So which means that uh, what I could do for Korapur may be different from what I do in Nagrampur or what I do in uh, Maharashtra or, or from village to village things could different. So I think understanding that the local uh, soil agroecological conditions and then taking it up is very important is a challenge and this definitely was an approach in the uh, has been an approach in odisha millets mission how far has that been successful uh, well it has been successful to some extent Mane, we have this has not totally been abandoned in fact chemical and fertilizers are not being uh, propagated as part of the program a farmer may or may not be putting it okay now so, so uh, having said that now uh, if you know the given good uh, the uh, point that you have mentioned that is a challenge uh, yes actually that is that is what this whole uh, our whole understanding and intervention this intervention that i was trying to talk about production processing market and consumption consumption intervention has been like if you have been to odisha in the last four five years of course the pandemic might have not have made it obvious but if you happen to be in the districts at particularly the blocks that we are working you will see that a lot of efforts have been done uh, and uh, Purna perhaps may explain and he may know from his our friends from Jaipur and Parapur that uh, they have uh, they have a power of they have a festival every year around December uh, uh, post harvest and during this harvest in recent years uh, the millet awareness is a very important uh, thing and there are a lot of stalls that are put up there where there are competition among different uh, uh, groups providing different new new uh, Millet recipes. So uh, the uh, millet mission itself would also have a stall here. They try to explain the awareness program. A lot of things have been done in Bhubaneswar. In fact, in any mela that has happened in Bhubaneswar in the last four or five years, whether whether it is 
spring festival, whether it is Bali uh, Yatra, whether it is uh, uh, the Krishi Mela, whether it is something else, a lot of uh, other the Adivasi Mela that happens. In each of these uh, initiatives, Odisha Millets Mission has been having a stall. They have been propagating uh, the nutritional and other uh, benefits and advantages of this. So uh, many a times, even school children, uh, sorry, college students have interned there. Uh, in fact, the first one, I, I should have got that picture. In 2017, uh, 18, uh, particularly 18, actually, the first batch of women SAGs were trained for on various recipes, and that led to uh, the one of the stalls being set up for Hockey World Cup in 2019. Okay, so in that 2018-19 uh, Hockey World Cup, if, if you uh, there was a millet stall there, which which sold uh, uh, savouries, bakeries, millet-based bakeries and savouries uh, which are modern in nature. Today in Bhuvaneshwar, five years ago in Bhuvaneshwar, people uh, and in many parts of this state, people did talk about that Giffen good. But that is changing. I won't say that okay, it has changed 100%, but it has changed. At least I have observed that in the last four or five years. Today in Bhuvaneshwar, if you go to a tea stall, you will get a millet cookie, which was not the case four or five years. There are many shops in Bhuvaneshwar which are selling millet dosas, millet savouries, mixture, bakery stuff. <laughs> Every bakery in Bhuvaneshwar and Kadak now sells at least millet based cake two to three. Uh, they are not selling as many numbers as the normal bake cakes they sell, but there are orders. Uh, they get almost one or two to three every week, which could be millet based. So yes, uh, this is happening, and this I agree that this needs to be done up in a much bigger way uh, across the country, uh, across the state. But uh, uh, but yes, uh, more needs to be done. Uh, that we need to uh, increase that awareness increase the uh, understanding that there are nutritional benefits and advantages and uh, the given goodness should be more identified with nutritional content rather than a pricing thing and in fact little millets the price of little millets if you go to the market is much much higher it is beyond reach of a common man so so that uh, it would not be proper to say that uh, the small millets thing the little millet oxen millet so they they have now suddenly become increasingly costly Again, because of the international year of millets, there is a lot of activities being planned globally. So uh, they are picking up uh, from the farmers, from the market. So this year, if you are actually um, uh, Urna and others, those who are from such areas, whether in Odisha or elsewhere, you'll see that this year prices have increased. There was a drought, uh, uh, but then uh, prices have increased beyond uh, beyond expectations. And I think that that would perhaps be the case for the next year, the International Year of Millets again. There is a question in the chat window. I think you partly answered that. But, uh, it says, what AFAS has a question. What should be the state initiatives for strengthening local supply chain other than already existing logistic services provided by various cooperatives and state governments? Yeah, I see, the thing is, see the uh, the local logistic chain should be first. We need to understand what is the supply chain uh, requirement. Like like I say, said, once processing is done, your shelf life reduces. So this should be obviously linked to the market and how the consumer gets it and consumes it also. Like if I get it and I try to keep it outside for 15, 20 days, I'll see pests. And I say that, okay, I did not get a good thing. And suppose I get uh, millets. Uh, again, there, there are small, uh, what do you call, quality control issues. So millet are small grains, and if after rain uh, there could be mud balls around the grains, and if you have not cleaned them properly, so if you pick up a morsel and eat it, you could get some muddy feeling, sand feeling, and so you need to clean that cleanliness, that uh, quality control is also needed. So there are small, small again uh, like the dehaler and other uh, uh, machines that have been uh, into innovations that have been cut. There are traditional knowledge uh, systems also which can remove the sand and grain or the gravel from, from the grain. So those are also needed. Uh, so once I, once you identify these are the activities, that means you need help in all the supply chain in all these activities. So uh, women SHGs are one way, but facilitating local entrepreneurs, giving them loans through banks and so that they can take up these initiatives. So these are, these are certain things which can be taken up. But I think the biggest challenge is that we have a global supply chain which will come up and which will which will take away and I, you have to maybe aggregate uh, these groups into so that they can come together and so can they, they can be a force 
uh, we need to do more research, of course, Lee, uh, at the ground level on each of these issues so that we can understand what are the concerns and try to see that how those can be addressed. And it's it's not a one size fits all. This is a challenge that we need to do is that we need to understand like what we do for, let us say, even Ragi in, in Sekurapur or in Jaipur areas, a thing may not be the same what we try to do for Ragi in Mayurbhanj. The recipes that we try to develop in Kurapur, which may have an easy accept acceptability, may be slightly different what we do in Keonjar or in Sundargarh or in uh, or even in Chhattisgarh. Okay, so yeah, these are these are I think uh, important challenges. But there are certain lessons from these challenges which can be universally applied and taken over. One lesson that I would say is that I think government should start giving uh, more respect to uh, both academia and civil society. And having said that, I should say that academia and civil society should also give respect to uh, these two entities, the other two entities, and they should start working together and they should start working on their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, uh, research has been a weak point all along. Uh, the funds that we get for research is very less and there are a lot of protocols that we need to follow while government and civil society, sometimes when they have a problem in hand, civil society would like to address it immediately. Government would also like to come up at least want you to give a suggestion immediately while their policy document process itself may take six months. Okay, but they will not wait for you to give a suggestion. If they have told you that give me something within one day or three days, you say, no, I, I need 15 days, he, she or he will not be able to wait for you. Because once they put up a note, there is a usual process which may take six months, but by that time they may be talking about other policy initiatives, other discussions. So these are, we should understand each other's constraints where well, they should be accommodative about giving us 15 days or one month. So the thing is that when you publish a paper one year or two years down the line, they will also listen to that or hear to that. But the thing is that that is then by that time, some of the uh, many times your publications two years down the line may not have any policy relevance because two years down the line, you may not have a pest problem as you had two years ago. Two years down the line, you may not have the supply chain issues that you're talking about because local enterprise has already taken over and there are other concerns now. So I think uh, this real time uh, understanding that we all need to work for this real time policy suggestions and we need to respect each other. And, uh, and I think we need to focus more education on uh, how to strengthen local enterprises. I think our, our education, our entire education system has been uh, those of us who get educated and whether in academia or other things, even those of us in academia who go and work with rural people, we are also sort of, uh, distant from them. So we can we are a sort of elite from them. We are separate from them. Even if you are from the same village, same community. Okay. Once you are a PhD, you are a different from your villages, friends uh, who are there back in the villages. You don't understand their day-to-day -day problems. You may think that, okay, I was there in the village three years ago. I understand my village. No, your village has changed three years down the line, even if it is your own village. Their problems are different. So I think that connect should be there more and, and then that understanding of that connect should be there at all levels, bureaucracy level. Sometimes a bureaucrat may think that I grew up in my village school, I know my village better. But sir, when you have become the chief secretary, your village is not the same. Village has changed. Okay. So, and the same for academia, same for civil society. And another thing is that we should listen to each other. We should give space to the other voice as much as we would like to uh, uh, be heard. Our voices to be heard more. So, I think. These are these are these are things, and uh, uh, there need to be uh, like Odisha Millet Mission itself could lead to hundred PhD thesis, but we could hardly do three four. Okay, and hundred when I say hundred PhD thesis, I am talking about agriculture sciences, science and technology. I am talking about marketing. I am talking about processing knowledges. So I am talking about a gamut of uh, uh, ICDS, nutrition related, socio-economic of course. Uh, there. So there could have been a, so there, there is so much to do in rural India, but go and soil your trousers or soil your dresses, I would say. So, but increasingly what is happening, our research is increasingly moving towards a digital computer world. So people, those who can sit in computers, their paper, papers will be published faster than if you do field work. So we also live in a world of dichotomy, but I think some of us still can, can uh, take that sacrifice, take that risk. Uh, <laughs> Okay, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. I think Purna wants to add a sentence. I think more a comment, I believe, Purna. Uh, sir, uh, sir yeah. I want to share one success story, sir. Actually, uh, one of my like friends, uh, they have uh, they have made a drinks like from millet and uh, some snacks. 
so their uh, like uh, uh, their startup has uh, uh, accepted by msme they got 5 crore rupees fund also recently so they are starting agro uh, like small agro processing industry in korapur itself and they have accommodated like they have uh, adopted some 1200 farmers so they are planning to give incentives to them uh, while uh, like inputs or some uh, like this uh, help and later they will uh, provide the products to them directly and they will purchase that products uh, in a MSP rate and that will like that is the one step towards this uh, supply chain i guess that is the starting of some local uh, agro processing industry and that will really help for these farmers you know that's really nice to hear uh, purla i will tell another story two years ago this is a very different kind of a story when we were doing our sort of trying to understand uh, an evaluation of how things have happened and our team was traveling uh, in your area jaipur Parapur area they were traveling from one part to a village where our intervention has happened and they had to cross a village where our intervention has not happened and then lo and behold what they see that in this village where the intervention has not happened they have taken up system of millet intensification and cultivation Dadi Rua. so the system of rice intensification you have you must have heard so millet intensification is something like that you have you you take one plant is and you give spacing so that means if we the plant the seed seedling of the plant gets space to grow so this this farmers who have done it so they might have heard from some of their friends or relatives in another village and they have started doing it on their own so this word of mouth by people knowing and understanding that is how it spreads and yes some facilitation is needed for startups and other things as you're rightly pointing out and uh, the farmers uh, should be uh, given adequate uh, uh, adequate compensation for that and also not only adequate compensation uh, all this should not lead to them not consuming these things because their nutritional requirement is also required and when i say nutritional requirement not only millets they should eat all kind of food they should have a balanced diet and it should be healthy so when we talk of balanced diet i need that that area should grow multiple kinds of things not only millets pulses uh, horticulture various other things we should give them good uh, healthy food so anyway nice to hear that uh, uh, experience maybe why don't you put up a case study or do a small study and uh, look up a uh, research uh, uh, in in consultation with the enterprise that is happening so, yes. so some of it will be that you help them that they reduce costs and they increase their profit but that they at the same time you also advise them to give little more not just msp if they are increasing their profit little more to the farmers do something yeah. more for the society back yes. there Yes, that is, yes, sir. I am following them, sir. Looking forward to your paper on that. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'll like I'll write mail, sir, to you about this. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for that session. Uh, hopefully, like we plan to have uh, these uh, invited sessions every year. Next time, hopefully, we see you offline at CDS. Huh? Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you. thank you for inviting me and uh, thanks. Thank you, Tiagu. Uh, thank you, Tirtha. And uh, uh, my regards to everybody there, Professor Mani and others. Yes, sir. Um, for the participants, just one, uh, I'm just making a note of a schedule change. Afternoon, we join at 1.45 for Dr. Aniketa Aga's presentation. And uh, Dr. Gaurav's presentation will be from uh, 3.30. That will be... Oh, hybrid mode so those in cds uh, please come to the john robinson hall and uh, others can join online maybe hmm? one thing i don't know whether this two days will be enough for you people maybe you should serve some millets to people there in this next two days if possible yes sir. Ne next time surely we'll do sir this time <laughs> okay okay thank you sir yeah just uh, uh, again, participants keep note of the schedule change. This happened uh, yesterday evening, so I'm just uh, pointing it to you again. 1.45, we all come back at 1.45 after lunch. Hmm? Okay, thank you. Yeah.